re reminds me of being in places like Fiji and India and places like that. You've got to be, pre be prepared for anything and everything. You don't know what's going to get sprung on you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you all here. It's lovely to be here myself. It really is. Today, I want to start a new series on a passage of scripture. It's intrigued me for a long time and I had actually done a series of teaching messages on it to take to India in early 2014. But they were simple messages, they did not really get right into the depth of what the scriptures say. And as I looked further into this message of Jesus, I realise that there's just so, so much more than the words that we need. So as you can see, we're talking about what we call the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus teaching his disciples and us about the Kingdom of Heaven and what it means for us. So the title for the series is Living in the Kingdom of Heaven. This is the first one of many, I believe. And this is the foundation, laying the foundation. So, Father, I just pray that you would please open our hearts this day, open the eyes of our spiritual understanding, that we may grow, Lord, in the knowledge of you. Father, let your word move in power. Let, us, let what is dead come to life this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know how long this is going to take to get through it all or how many messages there are, but there's going to be a lot. But God willing, as we unpack these words of Jesus, we will learn so much more about what it means to live in the kingdom of heaven. As I said, this is only the, the beginning, the foundation for the whole series today. And I must clearly state... I am indebted to the ministry of a man called Dr. R.T. Kendall, who in turn was indebted to the ministry of a Dr. D. Martin Lord Lloyd-Jones. Dr. Lloyd-Jones wrote much on this sub subject, and then Dr. Kendall used that work to rewrite and expand the subject. <coughs> Excuse me, it's mostly from his book that must have, much of this teaching comes from. So let's begin. I wonder if you can remember back to the year 2010. It's only 14 years ago, not long. There was an event that happened then that captured the imagination of the world. There was a mine collapse in Chile. Anybody got a memory of that? 33 men were trapped 700 metres, 2,300 feet in real measurement, below ground level. They were trapped there for 69 days before, one by one, they were pulled to the surface through a rescue hole. As each one of the trapped men was brought to the surface, to the surface, the media gave a, a short biography of each man, and video was shown of loved ones waiting to be reunited. There were emotional scenes because for the first 17 days, no one knew if there were any survivors at all. Finally, they all came out of the depths and the darkness of the earth, and they had all been rescued. Each one had been delivered from certain death and given a new chance at life. Brothers and sisters, the Bible uses the metaphor, metaphor of rescue to tell how God has delivered his children, you and I, from death to life. And in Colossians 1, 13, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Just, just, just look at those verses for a couple of moments. There's two kingdoms mentioned here, each opposite to the other. Our eternal well-being is in the balance here. We are born into the domain of darkness and in that we are separated from God. We are dead in the heart of the earth, as it were. And that is where we would stay except that God got involved and rescued us from death, transferred us into a new kingdom, his kingdom, from death to life. The word brought up there, 
the NIV is translated as transferred or translated in different versions. No matter what word is used, they all are from an original word that meant the deportation of a group of people or the removal of a group, a group to form a new colony in another place. Paul is telling us we have been transport, transferred or deported from one place into another. We've been deported into the kingdom of God's Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. When we look across Christendom, or at least the people we know or have known, do you wonder how many have either never had a revelation or have lost the revelation that they have been transferred into that living kingdom that is ruled by the King of Kings. Each one of us has the same opportunity to take hold of this wonderful kingdom. Because in the ministry of Jesus, there was a real emphasis on the kingdom. Go to Mark 1, 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. You see, Jesus' public teaching was filled with references to God's kingdom. And according to him, that kingdom had drawn near. He said his ability to cast out demons was proof that the kingdom of God had come to those who listened to him. Matthew 12, 28. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom have, of God has come upon you. <coughs> he made the kingdom the theme of his preaching, both before his death and after his resurrection. Go to Luke 4, 43. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I sent. And if you go on to Acts 1 3, same slide. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. He spoke about the kingdom of God. He spoke about the kingdom of God. It goes on and on. The kingdom was the focus of many parables. He taught it as a parable, as a priority in our lives. Matthew 6.33 Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Then everything else will be added unto you. We won't read it, but Luke repeats this in his letter in Luke 12.31. So Jesus teaches that the entrance to the kingdom comes about as people humble themselves, like little children. And those who did not receive the kingdom as children had no other means of entry. Look at Luke 18, 16 and 17. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter into it. He said that entering the kingdom of God came through the new birth. In talking to, in talking to Nicodemus, he said this in John 3.3. 3. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he was born again. Rich people, those who were hard of heart, were warned that they would find it very difficult to enter into the kingdom. The tax collectors and prostitutes would have little trouble in entering in. In Matthew 19, 24, Jesus talks to the disciples. And in 21, 31, he's talking to the religious leaders. And in those verses, he says this, 19, 24, Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. That's talking to the disciples. The next verse is Matthew 21, 31, the, the second half. Jesus said to them, talking to the religious leaders, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. What did they think about that, I wonder? It's rather strong words, isn't it? It's not only in the teaching of Jesus that we find the kingdom being given priority. The kingdom of God is shown in righteousness, peace, joy and power, but not in eating, drinking and, and, and um, talking. Romans 14, 17 
For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians 4.20, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. The early church preached and testified about the kingdom. Acts 8.12 But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. In Acts 20.25 Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Paul, that was Paul speaking. Paul preached the kingdom. Acts 28.23 they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So friends, are you beginning to get the idea that the kingdom of God is a subject that needs to be taught and preached at every opportunity? Jesus did. If it was good enough for Jesus, if it was good enough for Paul, it should be good enough for the church of today to emphasise and emphasise and emphasise. It was not just in the New Testament that we see the teaching about the kingdom of God. I won't go into depth in the Old Testament, but the coming kingdom was the expected promise of the Old Testament. Moses indicated the everlasting reign of God. Both Isaiah and Daniel, they mentioned it. We must remember that the kingdom is both a reality for the here and now and a promise to be inherited, both for now and for the future. Luke 17, 20. Once, having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, in verse 21, nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is within you, the here and now. There are conditions to be met before we can enter the kingdom of God in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we cannot carry on living as if there was no tomorrow and expect to inherit the kingdom. Cannot be done. The kingdom is a life to be lived and a future to be anticipated. It is the blessing of today and the hope of tomorrow. The kingdom is not dying and going to heaven, but rather it is your will be done on earth here as it is in heaven. And this is where we can fail to grasp the reality of the kingdom in our lives. Friends, too often the reality of the here and now gives way to the desire of the promise that is to be fulfilled. We keep our eyes this way instead of looking that way and this takes over. I'm sure you know what I'm saying. When that coming promise is fulfilled, it will be the end of God's mission to call all men to him and it will be wonderful. We have to balance against that the implications of Christ's current reign. Now, we are the visible examples of the coming reign of Christ. Whether you realise it or not or like it or not, we are. Our obedience to the scriptures, our life in the community, the fruit of the spirit and our love for the saviour, they all bear witness to the kingship of Jesus before billions who do not know him. It is our responsibility to help others come to know Jesus Christ in his atoning death and resurrected glory. So... As we move into the passage that Jesus taught, we know it as the Sermon on the Mount, we will begin to see more and more the importance of his teaching. But friends, there's one thing we must be clear on right at the start, and we have to get this fixed into our very beings. And Jeff, I'm so, so pleased to hear you talk about this just a few minutes ago. The Sermon on the Mount would be impossible to understand and live without the Holy Spirit. It would be impossible. 
All that Jesus taught was under the knowledge that the Holy Spirit would fall on the church after his death and his resurrection and his ascension. We, he knew that the Holy Spirit would make sense of all of his teaching and would enable believers to live according to that teaching. He knew that. Even last week, Jeff made that point very strongly in his message last Sunday. It is important. Without the Holy Spirit in our lives, we would never get anywhere at all. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones lived through most of the last century. He was a man noted for his straight talk when teaching the Bible. He abhorred liberal Christianity and he wrote these words regarding the Sermon on the Mount. He said this, listen to this. If you regard any particular injunction on the sermon as impossible, your interpretation and understanding of it must be wrong. I'll read that again. If you regard any particular injunction in the sermon as impossible, your interpretation and understanding of it must be wrong. He also said, our Lord taught these things and he expects us to live them. Jesus lived and practised what he preached and if you take the trouble to read the lives of the saints down the centuries and the men who have been most used by God, you'll find that every time there have been men who have taken the Sermon on the Mount, not only seriously but literally, they've lived it out. It's interesting, isn't it? Matthew chapters 5 to 7, they don't mention the Holy Spirit at all. But it is the Lord's teaching of the kingdom, the way the law has been fulfilled, how the Ten Commandments are applied by the Holy Spirit and what true godliness is. It is showing how the, whole, it is showing how the Christian life is to be lived, but it's made possible only by the Holy Spirit. Only by the Holy Spirit. We can't do it by ourselves. The righteousness that Jesus calls us to is a holiness that surpasses and outclasses the legalism of the Pharisees. Matthew 5.20 For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. He laid it down where the rubber hits the road. Such righteousness can only be fulfilled in us by the supernatural help of the Holy Spirit. The way Jesus interpreted the law and the way he wants us to fulfil it cannot be carried out in our natural level. It cannot. This level of righteousness, which includes blessing and loving our enemies, is possible but only, only by and in the Holy Spirit. In John chapters 14 to 16, Jesus teaches us about the Holy Spirit and his role in our lives. The Holy Spirit is our helper. And it is he who enables us to come to that level of holy living that the world really sees but really longs for. So, friends, as we travel through the Sermon on the Mount, I do believe and I hope, I pray, we will see open before us this glorious and dazzling manner of life that Jesus expects us to live. Matthew gives us a very full record of this teaching from Jesus, but if you take the time to go over and look to Luke's account, he also includes parts in his teaching too. And some of his accounts differ a little bit from Matthew, but by putting the two together, we do get a fairly complete picture. Matthew says that Jesus went on a, mountain, on a mountainside to teach, Luke says the place of the teaching was on a level place. That was in Luke 6.17. It suggests that the correct reading of mountainside would be hilly countryside. And by going to a higher place, Jesus would be clearly seen and more easily heard. And I've been told apparently there's an area in Galilee that you could still go to today, just north of Capernaum, which has great acoustic qualities when making a speech. The level place of Luke could be just a level area at the base of a hilly spot in that area. And I should mention also that although, although the account in Matthew is quite long, Luke does mention things that Matthew does not. So it's thought that Matthew's 
tax collector background enabled him to take notes, but not all of the teaching was captured. Whether this is so or not, this is one, I believe this, and I believe that it's, I believe it strongly. What the Holy Spirit has caused it to be recorded is enough for us to bring us into the kingdom that Jesus is leading us to. I don't think there's been anything left out that we need. It's all there for us. We're told that when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain and sat down. In the, in the chapters leading up to this point, Matthew has told us several things about Jesus. We're told that Jesus went through Galilee preaching and teaching in their synagogues. He'd already been teaching the gospel of the kingdom. There is a great healer of diseases and of those in severe pain. That he healed demon-possessed people and those having seizures. That news about him had spread all over Syria and that large crowds also came from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea and the region across the Jordan. Just bring up some verses from Matthew to confirm this. Matthew 4, 23 through to 25. Jesus went through throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. Notice, good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria. The people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds in Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, the region across the Jordan, they followed him. Many, many people. We're told that when he sat down, the disciples came to him. Some think that it was only the twelve that came to him to be taught. But the word disciple can also be translated as follower, which could include many. And Matthew concludes his account of the Sermon on the Mount with these words in Matthew 7, 28 and 29. When Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority not as the teachers of the Lord. It seems quite clear that while he may have been talking to the twelve, he was also heard by the multitude, <coughs> possibly including all those mentioned in that verse uh, 25 of the chapter 4 that we've just read, those large crowds from all those many different places. It seems to me that they were there too. He sat down to teach. This was a normal thing for a teacher in those days. It was the custom of those times to sit when speaking with authority. In those times, sitting carried an aura of authority that was not present when standing. You might remember that when Pontius Pilate made up his mind about having Jesus crucified, he sat down on the judgment seat. Luke gives a picture that well as illustrates the custom of the day. We go to Luke 4, 16 through to 21. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, this is Jesus, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He stood to read from the scripture, but he sat down to teach. Sitting down gave the signal that he was about to expound the scripture that he just read. Matthew tells us that when Jesus was arrested, he spoke to the people asking why they were arresting him there. Because every day they'd never arrested him when he sat in the temple courts teaching. He sat to teach. So why did Jesus teach the Sermon on the Mount? What was the purpose of it? Pretty obvious, isn't it? But there's two things that can be said about it. The first is it demonstrates the kind of teaching that should govern or direct the people of God. That's us. It's for us. How often have you heard teaching that astounded you? After Jesus had finished teaching, we're told the people were, were amazed by it. His teaching touched their hearts and moved their spirits. 
Secondly, it also demonstrates the kind of living with regard to character and conduct that should characterise the lives of Christians, you and I, through the power of the Holy Spirit. The law could not produce this kind of living. Let's go to Romans 8, 3 and 4. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. And the Amplified Bible expands and brings out the full context of these verses. We'll have a look at them. It says it beautifully. For God has done what the law could not do, its power being weakened by the flesh, which is the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit, sending his own son in the guise of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. God condemned sin in the flesh. He, over, he subdued it. He deprived it of his power over all who accept that sacrifice. And in verse 4, that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fully met in us who live and move, not in the ways of the flesh, but in the ways of the spirit. Our lives governed not by the standards and according to the dictates of the flesh, but controlled by the Holy Spirit. Friends, living this life cannot be done without the Holy Spirit. The law had no power to change lives and still has no power to change lives. Only the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit can change lives. If we're willing. That's a big rider, if we're willing. He will not override our will. But as soon as we ask him to change us and give him permission, he will do great things in us. And I can imagine that there's many here today who can say amen to that. I certainly can. I'm sure many of you can too. The righteous requirements of the law are fully developed in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. The general theme running through the sermon is the kingdom of heaven. But the particular theme is the way the Mosaic law was to be fulfilled and then applied in the lives of believers through the Holy Spirit. Jesus takes the word of the law. He opens it up to reveal the intent of the law. He often says words like, you have heard that it was said. But then he follows that up with, but I tell you. He expands it, opens it up to what the law really meant. He actually says that five times. But I tell you, but I tell you, but I tell you. <clears throat> he takes the law and he expands it to reveal the true meaning of it. This has been but a foundation to the teaching on the, on the Sermon of the Mount. But as we move into it and open it up, I'm sure there's much that will speak to us. I know that for a fact because there was much that's spoken to me as I've done it. God willing, we'll begin by opening up the Beatitudes, those first 12 verses of chapter 5. I don't want to alarm you, but there is a message just on each Beatitude. They're all, not all lumped together. There are some precious things that will give us a whole new outlook on what we call life. What we call life as opposed to the life Jesus is calling us to. So I hope that as we move into these messages from Jesus, I hope we're going to gain a whole new understanding of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. And we're going to leave it for there from there. But I just want to mention this one thing. If you, if anybody here has come to that place of seeking more of the kingdom of God for yourself, you're wanting more, you're seeking more. Perhaps now might be a good time. Maybe a good time. Come out and ask God. Just for a special touch for you. I just want to invite you to open up the front here. If you'd like to come out, we'll pray with you. You see, Jesus.
Jesus Christ died and he shed his blood that we could be set free from all sin. He did that for all people who have called on his name. Maybe as we've talked about his kingdom today, something has just clicked with you and you want more of that kingdom. So I want to give you the opportunity to respond to that glory now. Please come, we'll pray with you. No matter what the need, we'll pray with you anyway. So Father, I thank you for your word, your word about the kingdom of heaven. Your teaching about the kingdom of word of the kingdom of heaven, Lord, I pray that Lord, as you open up this message of Jesus to us, that Lord, it will just expand our horizon so much that we will be amazed, and that in that, Father, you will receive much glory. Lord, draw, continue to draw us closer to you, I pray, in Jesus' precious, precious time. Thank you, Lord, in his name. Thank you, Lord. So, 